Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Eden Presbyterian Church. I don't know if I really need the microphone, but it's probably good for our live stream friends. Um, today is the Sunday after Easter, which tends to be Holy Humor Sunday, to where we celebrate because Jesus conquered death and laughed death in the face by rising again. So you're going to hear some jokes today, and if you have a few during children's time, you can you know say them to me. Um, Ian told me to give it up at the UCC church because the kids had them better than I did. So Ian McMullen is here, pastor of the uh, pastors to the Presbytery. Um, he'll say a little bit more about himself at uh, sermon time, but he will be giving you the message today, and I am doing the rest of the service for us today. Um, our offering today is for the salary. 
And then today at 2 o'clock, if you are able to come to Sacred Heart, the community sing is happening. The free will donation uh, is going to be given to the Mitchell County Food Pantries. And then starting after the community sing, I will be on vacation through Sunday of next week. And the Reverend Margaret Hutchins will be leading you in worship next Sunday. Are there other announcements to be lifted up this morning? Then let us turn our attention to why we are here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for all who are able, please stand and join me in our responsive call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Blessed be the God of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God has given us a new birth and living hope of the resurrection. God has given us an inheritance that is imperishable and unfading. And this we rejoice, even when we suffer trials. For although we have not seen Jesus, we love him. And although we have not seen him, we believe in him. For the outcome of our faith is the salvation of our souls. Let everything that has breath praise God. And let us do so by singing our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken, number 362. Hey, Aaron. 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 Hey, Aaron.
Morning. You may be seated. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is where I flopped this morning, according to Ian. But you know, Holy Humor Sunday, you told me I flopped. I was outside because I had told you Holy Humor Sunday. I don't usually celebrate too well because I don't know how to put that all into worship. But I like to tell jokes. I think if I remember them. But Jet Cooper, Dixie. What do skeletons play? The bones. What? The bones. Trombones. <laughs> Susie knew it. Yeah, and he slapped his knee and thought it was the most funny thing ever. <laughs> so um, I have joke books, but I don't know if you'll get it. So I went down to Branson a few years ago, and I saw the comedians, the bald numbers. You ever ever seen them? They're kind of funny. But their joke book, what do you get when you cross a pigeon with a woodpecker? <laughs> a messenger who knocks. <laughs> See, they get it. I know, that was hilarious. I barely contain myself. <laughs> and right, here's another one. <clears throat> I just have to adjust. A hillbilly bought a stamp at the post office and asked the clerk, do I have to stick this on myself? And the clerk said, well, you can, but it works better if you stick it on the envelope. Oh, come on. Stick it to himself. Stick it on the envelope. There you go. <laughs> I'll stop with this one. A little girl interrupted her nightly prayer. <laughs> and she says, pardon me, God, while I kick my brother. <laughs> God wants us to laugh. Like I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, if God didn't want us to laugh, why did he create the platypus? It is the most funny animal ever. He has stingers, he's got a bill, he's got webbed feet like a duck. And then somebody said, well, what about a giraffe? I said, well, yeah, giraffes are pretty unique as well. But I always go with the platypus. So today we get to hear about Doubting Thomas, and Ian's going to bring that message to us. But, you know, one of the things that we tend to focus on is Doubting Thomas. And we think about how he had to see Jesus in order to believe. And we didn't ever have that opportunity. So I asked the kids this morning, and I'm going to ask you because you're all kids, why do we believe? Why do we believe that Jesus is here with us today? Because we were taught that. That's exactly what they said. They also said because we read it in the Bible. And so, you know, Thomas comes along and the disciples had already told him, Look, we have seen the Lord, and he laughed at them and said, I won't see, or I won't believe until I see the wounds on his hands and his feet and stick my fingers in his side. And a week later, so like today, Thomas saw Jesus. Jesus invited Thomas to touch his hands where the nails had been. He told Thomas to put his hand in his side, and then Thomas believed and said to him, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have been, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, there's a lot of people today in our world that don't believe Jesus really rose from the grave because they haven't really, they haven't seen him with their own eyes. And yet it's true, whether they believe him or not, because we have seen him. Last week I told you, we, I have seen Jesus, you have seen Jesus, and I see Jesus in each of you. That was my Easter message to you. And we accept him by our faith. And so we don't have to see to believe because we know it's true. And so we're going to hear more about that. Ian's going to take over. He's going to read our scripture for us this morning. Kate Tech, mm, coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Thank you.
Thank you, Dixie. Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Dixie mentioned, I am Reverend Ian McMullen. I am the pastor to the Presbytery of North Central Iowa and Des Moines and Prospect Hill. And I bring you greetings from the other 140 churches under my care. It is good to be with you. We are part of a much larger ministry here in Iowa. And I want to say thank you for all that you do to proclaim the gospel in this context. Uh, a little word about your pastor. Dixie is one of my favorite pastors, and I'm sure she's one of yours as well. One of them, I'm sure. <laughs> but she is uh, a joy to be around. You can see the joy of the spirit in her. Uh, whenever we're around Dixie, it's always uh, full of smiles and good, good humor and uh, relaxation. That's one of the things that I love about you, Dixie, is that I feel relaxed with you. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing, and I thank you for that. So you've got one of the good ones. Uh, this morning, I'll be reading from John chapter 20. Uh, this is a passage that comes uh, as a bit of a surprise uh, because the other Gospels don't contain the post-resurrection uh, views of Jesus, uh, his appearances. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't contain these, these stories of Jesus appearing to his disciples, but in, in John, uh, we do. So that's one of the unique things that we find uh, this passage, we all know, as Dixie alluded, is the Doubting Thomas passage. Uh, but there's so much more to it than that, and so many questions that need to be answered. So we'll, we'll discuss that now. Hear now the word of the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was also called the twin, was not among them at this time. So the other disciples told him later, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, <clears throat> put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May God bless to us an understanding of this, his holy word. Amen. It's okay to tell a joke? Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> this man's been shipwrecked on an island for 20 years, and he's just been going about living his life alone for 20 years. And one day a ship comes by and sees his fire on the beach. And the captain rows to shore and says, can we be of any assistance to you? He said, yes, I've been shipwrecked on this island for 20 years. Uh, and you're the first person I've seen in two decades. Thank you. Hallelujah. He says, well, tell me, how have you survived this long? He says, well, the, the island's got enough flora and fauna that I've been able to survive just fine. He says, as a matter of fact, I've built some structures here to help keep me from the weather. And the captain said, I'm intrigued. Show me these structures. I see three buildings here near the beach. And the man took him and showed him the first building. He said, this is my home. I've got a, a little tiki bar. This is my bedroom over here. Here's the living room. And out here is this beautiful veranda where I sit and I look at the surf all day. He says, this is impressive. The guy says, well, I've had two, you know, two decades to work on it. He says, well, show me the next building you've got over here. And he says, this 
is I'm really proud of. He says, this is the church in which I, I worship God. He says, I'm a Christian and I've never believed that God's left me even though I've been stranded on this island. He says, I put a lot of effort into this building. He says, I try to make it look as good as I can for the Lord. And the, the captain said, wow, this is amazing. You've done a really good job on this building. And I'm very impressed with your faith and with your, your skills. <clears throat> Finally, he says, tell me about that third building over there by the tree line. And the, the shipwrecked man looks at him and says, we don't talk about that building. That's where I used to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> but we are gathered today in this church, together with friends and family that we know and love. Many of you have probably been going to this church for well over the 20 years that shipwrecked man had been on the island. And this is home to you. This is a place where you come to find comfort in the word of God and the joy of a risen Christ. So if I say, as we did at the beginning of this service, Christ is risen, you say, Christ is risen indeed. So I say, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. That was ex excellent. That, that was much better than the UCC church. You can go back and tell them that. I had to get them to do it twice. I did. But <clears throat> it feels comfortable to do that here in our sanctuary where God is close. We have the cross and we have the candles lit and we have the beautiful music. Thank you, Carol. And it's just one of those places where we, we feel close to God. I call this a thin place. The line, the separation between us and heaven is very thin. So it feels good. But then we read a passage like we read today. And I'm thinking about Thomas in particular, but not just Thomas, the other disciples. Think about the people who aren't here today, right? I'm sure there are some folks who are not, uh, not in attendance today for one reason or another. And what if, what if I told you Jesus was going to walk through the front door here in about five seconds? And Jesus come and stood uh, came and stood among us, and we had the experience of getting to meet our risen Christ. Would you tell those folks that aren't here today? Man, you should have seen it. He was here. And they would say, yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's what Thomas did. And like Thomas, I got questions about this particular passage. Oftentimes, uh, when I read my Bible, I read it just out of rote. I've heard this story before several dozen times. I'm sure you have too. The Doubting Thomas story, right? But if you sit there and you critically look at it, start to circle the verbs and ask questions about what's missing, you come up with a lot of questions, and I did too. I'm like Thomas in that way. Was Thomas the only one that wasn't there? Or were there other people missing? Well, scripture doesn't say, they just talk about Thomas because he was the one that raised a fuss. How long was Jesus there? They say he appeared among them. Did he stay for supper? Was he, did he leave through the doors? Or did he just evaporate like he materialized? When the scripture says he breathed on them, it sounds kind of creepy, it's weird. And if he breathed the Spirit on them in this house, why did the Spirit not arrive until they're gathered at Pentecost? I notice your beautiful Pentecost banners hanging here in anticipation for the next few weeks. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, did he mean right then, or did he mean at Pentecost? When the Holy Spirit shows up, make sure you receive him and welcome the Holy Spirit. Now, if you read your Old Testament, you find out that the scripture that he says, and he breathed on them, is part of the creation story. When God was forming Adam's body, he brought the dust of the earth together and he breathed in the, the nostrils and gave it life. So that's how humankind was brought forth according to the creation story. This is a continuation of that creation story where Jesus breathes new life into the disciples. <clears throat> but it still doesn't answer the question about how he got past the locked doors. And by the way, did you notice that the locked doors were because of the church people? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. He said the doors were locked because of the Jews, who were the church people at the time. In many other scripture passages, 
we see Jesus showing up. But it's not a surprise. This is a surprise because Jesus is supposed to be dead. He's supposed to be somewhere else. He's not supposed to be among them. Have you ever had one of your grandkids or your children walk up behind you when you weren't paying attention or you weren't looking? And all of a sudden they're there. And whoa. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing Jesus was. No one heard the door open. All of a sudden Jesus was just there. And I'm sure they were elated to see him. Of course, the scripture does say that. They, were, they rejoiced in seeing Jesus. <clears throat> but I'm sure they also thought, now wait a minute, we had just gathered here. Um, we were sure that he was dead. Uh, we were just getting together to talk about some of the lessons he taught us. You know, maybe have a little potluck. Maybe uh, we could form a committee, right, and explore it a little bit. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll put it in the newsletter. You know, everybody get your calendars out. Let's set another meeting time. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is there among them. And they realize that it's not over. That that life of proclaiming the gospel with Jesus among them isn't over. Jesus is still among them. And they're still moving forward with that, that ministry. And that could have been a little scary. But that's why Jesus says, peace be with you, over and over again. But he also says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. He says, you, as comfortable as you are in this setting, among your family and friends, this isn't where you belong and stay. This is where you go from. <clears throat> so like the disciples, we find the outside world a little scary. For example, I say, Christ is risen. You say, yes. Christ is risen indeed. Excellent. You guys are really good at that. But what if, what if I find you in the, the line at the grocery store? And I say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. It's a little weird, though, isn't that? What if you're sitting in a restaurant and the server brings you the bill and you say, Christ is risen? It's hard for them to say Christ is risen indeed. You don't know if they're a, a Christian or not. And it's completely out of context, isn't it? It's a little weird. But it's, it's the response that Thomas gives that I like. He says, you know, he's, Christ says, okay, you have questions? I've got answers. Here are the piercings in my hand. Here are the piercings in my side. Come and see. And Thomas says, all right, you already breathed on us. Let's just not do the touching thing either. <laughs> but he recognizes Jesus. And he, he responds like this. He says, my Lord, my God. And I wonder how he said it. Because that's kind of an incomplete sentence, but it's also a complete thought. He says, my Lord, my God. That was his declaration. That was kind of like his... Uh, his Apostles' Creed, or his Nicene Creed. It was, this is what I believe. You are my Lord and my God. You just happen to leave that object out there of you. My Lord, my God. It's one of those sentences. But you wonder how he said it. Did he say it, my Lord, my God? Or did he say, oh, my Lord, my God? It's one of those things where inflection and context means everything. And we can't really get that from the written scripture. But we can imagine how that might have been. It's like the word dude. There are a lot of different words that you can use to kind of convey what it is you're feeling. Um, when I was in college or in high school, I used the word dude a lot. This was back in the 90s, so or in the 80s, 1980s. So it, it was that context. But you could use the word for anything. If your friend was like trying to sneak around the corner and scare you, you'd say, dude. Or if you are um, in a different context, where you say, Thomas, we just saw Jesus. He's like, dude, no way you did. Or, Jesus, I need your help during this time. Dude. Or when the disciple said, you remember when Jesus made us feed those 5,000 people? Dude, that was hard. How did he say, my Lord, my God? How did he declare that belief? The thing about this story should be a lesson to us that he did it. Jesus appeared to Thomas 
in context, in amongst the friends. You know, uh, he wasn't, Thomas wasn't there for the first meeting. And Jesus, you know, as he appears anywhere he wants, could have just stopped by Thomas's house, rung the doorbell and said, hey, Thomas, didn't see you at the last meeting. I just wanted to let you know, here I am. I have risen. But he didn't. He did it in the context of the people where Thomas was comfortable, was understanding, was part of the community that was learning and doing what God would have them do. And so when we come here on Sunday mornings, we find that Jesus appears among us, not as he walks through the door and sits in a pew with us, but rather that he appears with us in the Holy Spirit. God has breathed upon us that Holy Spirit. And as you look, and as Dixie so eloquently said earlier, we see Jesus in each other. As a child of Christ, God has blessed you with the Holy Spirit, that people can see Christ in you. Jesus appeared to the group because that's where the group learns to go forth. As the Father has sent but me, Jesus says, so I send you. So in one sense, Jesus was offering Thomas a chance to experience what it means to feel loved and known by God. And in another sense, Jesus was saying, here is the energy you need. Here is the, the, the message that I have for you to share with the world. You, as a group of people, go forth. <clears throat> Jesus tells the disciples that many would come after him who would not have the same experience of seeing him. And that's where we are. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. You're here, and so because you're here, and if you're new here, welcome. I'm new here. Thank you for your welcome. But we have a message to share. Christ is risen, and Christ is risen indeed. Who was it that told you about Jesus? Chances are you were drunk here by your parents or your grandparents when you were a very young child. Maybe someone told you when you were an adult, a friend or a family member, and said, we should go to church. But it wasn't until you said yes to Jesus, till you saw Jesus at work in your life, that you came to believe. And we have that responsibility and that joy to go amongst those people that are not here today and say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Yeah, you're starting to feel that. Yes, that's what, that's what it looks like to say that and respond that way. Now, I don't say you should go out into the world and say, Christ is risen, and then point to somebody. <laughs> yeah. But you have that message for them that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. In every century, in every generation, in every decade, every year, and oddly enough, every Sunday, Jesus comes and stands among us and says, Peace be with you. But Jesus also says, if you've got questions, that's okay. He didn't say to Thomas, you weren't here, you missed it, you're out. He didn't. He appeared again to the disciples and said, peace be with you. You've got questions, I've got answers. That's the message that we can send. And that's the message that I tell the person in the mirror every day. God loves you, and so do I. Go forth. As the Father has sent Jesus, he, so he sends us to tell the world about a dude named Christ. Use more words if necessary. Amen. <laughs>
that Christ is risen, let us gratefully give of our offerings in praise of Christ's ministry through us and for us. Will the ushers please come forward and collect our morning tithes and offerings? to be lifted up. Then let us come to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come to you today and we do give you thanks for the time that we are gathered in this space, for being your body of Christ, to be able to worship together and commune together. Lord, we thank you for sending your spirit upon us so that we're able to see Christ in each other. We come to you today, Lord, with many concerns and worries upon our hearts and our minds, and we give them over to you, Lord, knowing that you will come into everybody's life that needs your help when it comes to pain, to sorrow, and that you will be there for those that are in need of healing. Lord, we ask that you be with Laura, who is recovering from surgery, be with Pat and the rest of the family as they encourage Laura. Lord, we ask that you be with Allison Baltus and Allison Schutte, and we ask, Lord, that they find new forms of work. Lord, we ask for you to be with their families 
encouraging the Allisons in support and whatever else they may need at this time. Lord, we also continue to pray for our loved ones who are homebound, who are in the Nora Springs nursing home, those that are in Faith Home and Apple Valley at Evergreen. And Lord, we ask that you send your healing and loving spirit upon the members of not only this congregation, but of our families. Send them peace and send them your love and light. Lord, we continue to pray for all of our medical workers. And we pray, Lord, for our men and women of the military who are serving this country and their families who support their loved ones. Lord, we continue to just lift these concerns to you, knowing that you hear them and knowing that it is your will and so, Lord, we also turn to the joys that are in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for being among us with our birthdays and anniversaries that are being celebrated, with our family gatherings that happened in the last week and continue to happen, and with the gathering here in this place at Eden Presbyterian Church. Lord, we give you thanks. But most of all, Lord, we still celebrate your son, Jesus Christ, and we come to you praying the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So now let us stand, if you are able, and sing hymn number 247, The Day of Resurrection.
Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. But we're not supposed to just stay here and say that. We may have questions, but the world outside has many questions that we find answers to when we come here. And it's not just here that we find those answers, but it's in scripture and in prayer and in communion and fellowship. Go and be that to the people outside that aren't here today. You know that God is always with you. Peace be with you. And Jesus says, so as I, as God the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.